everyone, this is Lomi, and today I'll be talking a little bit about airbrushes. I get a lot of questions about airbrushes and such, and after I took mine apart to soak it in cleaner, I realized it might be a great opportunity to talk about them. So I'll show you how to clean a brush like this one and reassemble it, and tell you what I can about the airbrush setup I use. So my airbrush is a Master G233, which I was able to get incredibly cheap. I got lucky and only paid about $5 for the set. I've just finished soaking the body of the airbrush here and rubbing alcohol to help remove some built-up gunk that was impeding performance. Hopefully it'll take care of some of the problems I've had. Never soak a fully assembled airbrush in anything, as it can damage some of the parts. Mine's still wet inside because I just finished scrubbing and rinsing. When you get an airbrush, it's a good idea to get some of these little brushes for cleaning it. Don't try to use pipe cleaners from a craft store or anything like that, because they can leave lint, which will clog your airbrush later on. When cleaning, you'll want to run your brushes through the body, the nozzle, where the air valve connects, anywhere air or paint passes through. You can use airbrush cleaner, soap and water, rubbing alcohol, mineral spirits, and just avoid anything containing ammonia as it can eat the finish off the metal and really mess up your brush. Since I'm trying to fix a sticky trigger, I'm going to use rubbing alcohol on a cotton swab to clean the air valve and the space around the trigger. I'm picking up a lot of old oil and lubricant, which gets sticky after a while, so that may be part of the issue. The brushes are great for cleaning the inside, but sometimes they don't reach everything. Following up with a cotton swab is always a good idea. I'll make sure the nozzle is really clean while I'm at it, then it's time to reassemble the brush. Here are all the pieces laid out roughly where they go. As I reassemble the brush, I'll want to make sure everything is well lubricated. I use Badger's airbrush lubricant for this, but sewing machine oil will work in a pinch. As I said, mine is a master airbrush, so yours might be a little different, but most airbrushes are pretty similar. This piece goes in first. It's a few pieces together. The needle chucking guide and the needle adjusting sleeve. You can see the guide has a groove in one side, which lines up with a screw inside the airbrush. Slide that on over the screw, and then screw it in, but not too tight just yet. The next piece is the secondary lever guide. On newer Master Airbrushes, this is actually attached to the needle chucking guide, but mine is not, so it's a pain in the neck to put back. It should go in turned this direction, like the letter S, with the top curve pointing toward the back of the airbrush. If your airbrush is like mine, you'll need to insert it sideways, then turn it inside the body of the airbrush. After the lever guide is in, we put in the lever, which is the trigger. The wiggly piece on the bottom is called the piston, which fits inside the hole going down into the air valve. Make sure you turn it in the right direction. This can be tricky to get in since the piston swings freely. Just wiggle it around until it slides in place. Then you can tighten the chucking guide, which contains the spring that pushes the trigger forward. Next, we'll reassemble the nozzle. The nozzle is really tiny and easy to lose or break, so be careful. You can see it has a small rubber o-ring on the threads, which helps keep it from leaking air or paint while you're spraying. The rubber seals should only ever be cleaned with soap and water. They should also be lubricated every time you take the airbrush apart. The nozzle screws into the nose of the airbrush clockwise. My airbrush came with a tiny spanner wrench to help put it in and I never use it. These threads are so tiny that it's super easy to over tighten the nozzle and break it, so I only screw mine in by hand. If the threads on your nozzle break, you'll get air leaks or the nozzle can just fall off. If that happens, you have to remove the broken threads from inside your airbrush before you can put in the new nozzle. 
If it happens, get a wooden toothpick and insert it into the end of the airbrush. Push just until it's snug, and then twist counterclockwise to unscrew the broken threads and remove them. The next thing to go on is the rubber o-ring for the air cap. Make sure this is lubricated too. It helps keep the rubber from drying out and breaking. Breakage means air leaks, which impacts airbrush performance. Then the air cap screws on. Ooh, my nozzle has some paper towel fuzzies on it. There we go. Last is the needle cap. This protects the needle from damage and protects your fingers from the needle. Not all airbrushes let you remove this piece, but if you're working on really big projects, removing it can help reduce splattering because heavy paint flow can cause paint to build up inside this cap. When a droplet is big enough, it'll splatter out onto your project. Now that the nozzle is together, we're ready to insert the needle. The needle chucking nut goes on the back of the chucking guide. Turn it once or twice, not enough to tighten it yet, just to get it where it belongs. Before inserting the needle, it's a good idea to rub a drop of oil over it. Be careful with the point, they're really sharp. The oil helps it slide through the airbrush easily, but it also helps prevent buildup and corrosion of the needle while it's in your brush. Then slide the needle through the chucking nut and chucking guide and into the airbrush. If it sticks, pull it back and try again. Never force your needle in or it could damage it. When it's all the way in, tighten the chucking nut. Before we screw on the handle, we want to make sure the o-ring on it is lubricated too. Then screw it on. On the back is an adjusting screw which can be tightened to limit how far back you can pull the trigger. I don't really use this because I like having a lot of room, but if you're new to airbrushing or doing something really precise, it can be great to have because screwing it tighter means you can't accidentally pull the trigger back too far and blast your project with a heavy stream of paint. I like having a full range of play on mine, so I leave it pretty loose. Last of all is where I think the sticky trigger problem is. This is the air valve that goes on the bottom of the airbrush, where the air hose attaches. The piston inside feels a little gummy. You can dismantle the valve with the right tools, but I can't find them today, so I'm going to clean it, add some oil, and hope it fixes the problem. This too has a rubber o-ring, which I removed to make sure I don't get alcohol on it. So with a cotton swab, I'll use rubbing alcohol to clean the gunky ends of the piston. No wonder it was sticking. This is gross. I'll clean both ends, add a drop of oil, and then pump the piston up and down to work the oil into the valve. That feels smoother already. I'll rub the extra oil onto the o-ring and then put it back on the threads. Then this screws into the bottom of the airbrush. Whoops, doesn't want to. There we go. And now it's all back together. My trigger still feels a bit stuck, so I'll remove the handle and needle, then put a big drop of oil down in the trigger housing. Working it up and down a bit will push oil down through the trigger mechanism. That's a bit better. It's getting some spring back now. If this doesn't fix it, it means the spring inside the air valve is worn out, and I'll have to buy a replacement. But we'll see how this does for now. So now that you know how to clean and reassemble an airbrush, let's talk a bit about my setup. Mine is a gravity feed brush, which is why it has the cup on top. Airbrushes come in two main varieties, gravity feed and siphon feed. 
A siphon feed brush has a small jar that screws onto the bottom, and it sucks the paint out of that container. I find gravity feed brushes easier to clean. The other big difference is that a brush can either be single action or double action. Mine is double action, which means I can press the trigger down to control the amount of airflow, and pull back to control the paint flow. A single action airbrush only allows you to control the paint flow. You pull the trigger back, and it manages the airflow automatically. Personally, I love having a separate airflow control because I can use the air to blow dry projects as I'm painting them. When you get an airbrush, you'll also need a hose, a compressor, and possibly a regulator. My airbrush included a hose and came with a small quick release air valve that goes between the airbrush and the hose. I definitely recommend getting one of these. It lets me cut off airflow right at the brush. And it's also free spinning, which means I can freely rotate the brush on the end of the hose without getting tangled. It's really nice to have. The other end of your hose can either connect directly to your compressor or hook to a regulator. This is a regulator with a water trap. The gauge shows you what your air pressure is, and you can turn the knob on the top to raise or lower the air pressure. If there's any condensation in the air, which happens a lot in humid climates, it will catch the water in this cup. Water in the airlines can cause airbrushes to sputter or spit paint. But honestly, my regulator has never caught a single drop of water, so I don't know how big a concern it really is. The airflow control knob snaps down and locks, so it's impossible to accidentally change your air pressure. The compressor hose would screw into the other side. You can see the direction the airflow is supposed to go because it has an arrow on the back. Depending on the size of your compressor, you may need a reducer here, but my regulator came with two. I don't need one on this side because I don't use a hobby compressor. My compressor is an 8-gallon Husky tank compressor, which can be bought at most tool stores for about $100. The same price as a good hobby compressor. I use this thing for car tires and power tools too, and I don't see a need for a smaller compressor when I already have this. The hose for my compressor screws right into the regulator. If you have air leaks, you can add Teflon tape to reduce them. You can see some white Teflon tape on my air hose. The reason I like this big compressor is I can fill it to about 100 psi in a minute or two, then airbrush for half an hour or more. It's way less disruptive to my family and neighbors. It also has a regulator built in, so I can control the air pressure right here at the hose connector. The top gauge is how full the tank is, and the bottom gauge shows the air pressure setting for the regulator. The hose also snaps in easily, so it's easy to get myself untangled in a hurry. It just pops in right like that, and removing the hose again is as easy as pushing back on the sleeve. The only downside is it's huge. It's more practical and better for hearing because it doesn't run all the time, but it's big and heavy and can be difficult to move around in store. But if you have some place to keep it, or have a family member who already has one for other purposes, a full-sized compressor can be a great option that tends to last longer than most hobby compressors. And that's about it for today's airbrush overview. In the coming weeks, I'll show you a bit about thinning paints and airbrushing basics, so if you have any specific questions, drop them in a comment below, and I'll try to make sure I cover them in the future videos. Thanks for joining me again. See you next time. Bye.